Stephen Thomas is the Assistant Dean for STEM Education, Teaching, and Learning, and Dr. Julie Labarkin is the Associate Dean for STEM Education, Research, and Innovation, both in the Office of the Associate Provost for Undergraduate Education at Michigan State University. It's great to welcome you both to MSU today. We're excited to be here. In September of 21, MSU opened its state-of-the-art and now multiple award-winning STEM teaching and learning facility. So let's talk with Stephen and Julie about MSU's evolving STEM curriculum and about some of the things that go on inside the STEM building. And why don't we start with each of you giving me a little bit of your background, what else you do at MSU, and kind of what attracted you to these positions focusing on STEM. Uh, okay, so I'll dive in. I um, uh, My background is actually in entomology. So I studied uh, disease evolution in insects and uh, also pheromonal communication in insects. And so um, not in education. <laughs> and then when I got to MSU, I uh, switched over to looking more about how do we teach and how do we uh, teach effectively. And paired up with Julie actually uh, early on in in my career here. Um, and since then, I've kind of done a, just a lot of teaching in, uh, in the biology courses. So doing a lot of um, majors courses in ecology and then also teaching in the Center for Integrative Studies in General Science, which is basically the gen ed um, science course for non-scientists. So a lot of my work has been looking at how do you teach science to non-scientists? And Julie, how about you? That's a tough act to follow. Um, Let's see. I have a background in geology and physics, and I got a PhD in geophysics. And then I did a National Science Foundation postdoc in STEM education. So early on as an undergraduate, I was super fascinated with classrooms and why people teach the way they teach. And I did that work on the side as a graduate student, and then I was able to focus on it. So I did mountain building research and science education research hand in hand. And here at MSU, I'm a professor in Earth and Environmental Sciences. I'm in the Center for Integrative Studies in General Science. I'm also in Create for STEM, and now I get to have this position with the APUE. And my work, um, I teach, but I also do a lot of research on the human dimensions of STEM, really with an overarching focus on equity and justice. And talk a little bit about how you both told me the goal wasn't initially to have two of you, right? There was maybe going to be one dean, but t- talk about that <laughs> right. process and how this came about. So um, if you read the job ad for the position, it's a very complex position. And Stephen and I were talking about it, and we both said that alone, neither one of us could do that job. But we realized that together, we really are um, sides of a multifaceted die. And we have different communities we engage with. We have different strengths. And um, we collaborate really well together. We've co-taught. We've had grants together. We've created curriculum together. And so we decided to ask if we could apply as a team. And they said we could. And we did. And I think they saw what we saw. That's cool. So we know that uh, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Why have we heard so much about STEM in the last decade or so? Why is it so important to focus more in this area? So I would say that there are, there are multiple reasons. Yeah. I think a lot of times when people talk about career preparation, um, a lot of the jobs that are um, available um, – plug into those Mm -hmm. disciplines or those skill sets that uh, those disciplines will train. Um, And it's, uh, I think there's also a link to this desire for innovation. So I feel like societally, we really are always focusing on this idea of innovation and seeing STEM as, um, uh, as a pathway to getting that type of innovation. So I also would add, in my worldview, I take a very expansive um, uh, view of what STEM is. And, and to me, it's, it's the systematic investigation or solving of problems, um, understanding of the world around us. And that includes people and all the things that people do. And so I think the other thing that's a really a value for thinking about innovating in STEM is really recognizing that 
Um, STEM is happening in the arts. STEM is happening in the humanities. STEM is happening in business and communication. And if you look across our campus, there's STEM um, people who teach STEM focused courses um, or adjacent courses, and also people who do research in STEM education housed everywhere on this campus. Um, so it's important, I think, because it's integrated in how humans live in the world. Very interesting. And you led me into my next question, Julie. What about <laughs> adding the A, which we often do for arts, to make STEAM? So I'm going to just say that that is Stephen Thomas. So Stephen Thomas, Dr. Stephen Thomas, is both a zoologist and a, scien a scientist uh, ugh, and an artist. So you can check out his incredible art online if you want. Um, but I'm going to let him answer that question. I just like to point out that he's a zoologist and an artist. I don't know how to respond to that, so I'm just going to uh, take that. Um, the I think the adding of the A is actually, it has some really interesting uh, roots and discussion around that. So uh, if you talk to various communities, there's a discussion about how, um, you know, why just the arts? And, you know, there's also a role for humanities and social sciences and... Uh, medical health education is sometimes left off of STEM or not seen as being included in that, although depending on who you ask. And so, you know, they come up with steam. <laughs> and so like, there's lots of, you know, like how do we think about it more inclusively? But I think it's, it is pointing to this desire of how do we have more um, communication and dialogue between these disciplines and I think one of the challenges, though, is like historically when we've seen STEAM, there's been this um, bringing in of the arts in order to make STEM more entertaining. But there hasn't been like this actually more maybe robust discussion uh, about how their ways of knowing can actually inform each other and mm -hmm. improve the process for both of them. And so how do we not just take from the arts, but also participate and have a more richer engagement between those communities? So sometimes the STEAM um, acronym, I think, raises hackles of what people are perceiving what you're talking about. But it is in, that is something that I think we're really passionate about, about like how do we have these conversations and dialogues? Because honestly, uh, the ones that we've been having on campus are just fascinating. I mean, Can you know, you provide some examples? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to provide one example. I had this fantastic conversation lunch with uh, a professor here who is an engineer and has a master's of fine arts. And his art is coded art. So he, he types programs to make art move, like robotic arms, et cetera. And so how do we integrate that true intersection of art and technology into what people who go into the STEM building see and understand? And we're working on having him come into the building and having his students create something that then becomes part of what the building offers. You want to talk about puppets? Oh, yeah, of course. Who doesn't want to talk about puppets? Uh, there's a group on campus uh, across disciplines who are in interested in puppetry. And so uh, we are housing them in the STEM building um, and trying and, – and actually we have a grad student who's also sitting in on the group in order to try and um, have an observer who's kind of documenting what – STEM aspects the puppetry group is engaged in, right? Because there could be STEM in, with regards to material choice or talking about the forces uh, that drive the puppets, or it could actually be about science narratives and how do you get people engaged in uh, science who may not view themselves as scientists. And I would actually say that that's one of the hopes that we're seeing for the STEM building, that if we have these relationships uh, with other disciplines, that it will allow others to actually come into STEM spaces and view themselves as uh, able to engage with that work. Can I add one last thing? Yes. Um, it's about STEM. So science, technology, engineering, and math. Very traditionally, that might be viewed as the natural sciences and engineering. And Stephen and I take a much more expansive view. So the College of Ag, we really want them to be involved. Um, uh, nursing. Nursing. Um, there, there's actually a, a, a group that is medical education research on campus. Um, 
College of Communications, right? Com Arts, they have people who do science work, um, science communication, right? And so um, we're really thinking expansively, and it's not narrowly focused on one college or a handful of colleges. And well, and you've both been doing it throughout the conversation, but a little bit more on the STEM or STEAM curriculum at MSU, how it's evolving. There's a, uh, that's a, <laughs> that's a, such a large pool to dive into. Um, so one of the interesting things about MSU, I would say distinct, is that we have a very large community of disciplinary based education researchers. So these are researchers that uh, have trained in their field. So let's say chemistry and who uh, do their research on the learning that goes on in the classroom. And so they're be better able to kind of integrate the educational components with the disciplinary knowledge. And and so that work is phenomenal across campus. Mm -hmm. So in physics and biology and chemistry and animal and science and yeah. Medicine. We, yeah. And so. Geoscience. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I assume that you would be putting that in there, um, but uh, so that's a really exciting piece across campus. And then we have a, a, a just a very large pool of practitioners who um, who don't do what you might consider formal science, where they're doing experiments, like formal experiments, and then reporting out in the literature. But they are trying to understand their students and the ways that they can be effective in the classroom. And I think part of our work is how do we pull all of these communities together in order to have uh, kind of communication and spread of, of materials between those two communities. And I think that's in fact your question was about how is STEM education or STEAM growing at MSU. I think we're at a cusp of potential growth. And this really is an ideal time for the building to have been, uh, have the ribbon cutting ceremony and it's ready for use because now we have um, a, a place and I do some research on place-based education and we were both sort of surprised in talking the other day about, you know, there's a building and it's a building, but actually it is turning into a place where people want to be, where students want to be, where faculty want to teach. People want to understand and be part of a, a particular place. And that gives us an opportunity to grow the community in unforeseen directions. You have to get lots of voices around a table. And that's one of my foci is I really want to build community among anyone who thinks of themselves in any way, shape, or form as trying to understand learning in STEM writ large, um, build a community and have us work together to elevate the entire community. And what are the four goals of the building you had mentioned to me once before? <laughs> uh, the four goals, um, so we, we kind of combed over the, um, the design documents for the, for the building and some of the communication and talked with uh, the admin people who had uh, participated and uh, faculty also participated in the design of the building. And it seemed clear that there were four main goals that uh, they had identified. Uh, there's experiential learning. Um, so how do you learn by doing? Uh, there is uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. So how do you create a space where everyone feels welcome? Uh, there's career preparation. And then there's interdisciplinarity. And so we've kind of broken them up between us. So not that we're not all focused on all four of them, but I'm kind of uh, wrapping my head around the interdisciplinarity and the experiential learning and Julia's career planning and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, and again, you've been touching on it, sort of your goals and responsibilities as assistant and associate deans for STEM at MSU. So I just want to say that the reason Stephen's an assistant and I'm an associate is because of a very old mechanism for giving people titles. So he's not an assistant and I'm not an associate. We're equivalent, right? We're co-partners in this endeavor. Um, what are our goals and duties? So it's quite interesting. The goals and the duties that are clear are really to facilitate that building as a nexus for innovation right, as a place where we can bring STEM and other folks, just the whole campus together, to do new, innovative, 
um, teaching and research and learning, education research. It's not a research building, it's a teaching building um, around these large questions about STEM education. There are other goals that we've identified. And so again, for me, one of my big goals is how do we take on paper, Michigan State University is the top school for STEM education research. Um, not in engineering, we don't have a lot of effort yet in the College of Engineering and Education Research, but outside of that space, we're pretty, pretty exceptional. How do we bring those diverse communities together to innovate as a whole? Um, and also, how do we put MSU a little bit more on the local, state, national, international map as the place to go. Certainly we're on the map for K-12 education. We have one of the top colleges of education. Um, undergrad education, we're sort of on the map, but I think that we are clearly a top star in that space and we want everyone else to know it. <laughs> so sometimes I think that um, uh, Julie has to give me that vision of the of the – of the global because I feel like I like inherently am like, how do we help faculty in their classroom and how do we build community? I'm a very local driven thing and not that Julie isn't cause she actually does a lot of community building local, but she has this eye also on like, how do you communicate that out more broadly? I think, um, I'm just really interested about how do we, improve engagement, especially like right now, I feel like, uh, because of the pandemic and, uh, the amount of coping that everyone's had to do that there's a kind of malaise over like what our experience mm -hmm. is. And I really feel that this interdisciplinarity piece and this experiential learning component of just being able to th sit and experience something and to grow your understanding in communication with others, I find it really exciting. And I feel like that could really energize our students. And so like, you know, Julie's talking about these uh, faculty members who are working at the intersection. Um, you know, like we had another faculty member who we were talking to who was looking at how do you, um, how do you remove toxins from paint in, in historic paintings using microbes? Again, it's just like, it's, it's at the intersection. It's this really interesting thought process of how are you using uh, biological uh, organisms in this culturally interesting way. And so to me, like that engages people in a different way than just saying, OK, well, we're going to study now. How do you um, how do you bioremediate <laughs> toxins? Right. It just it's, it adds a whole new layer of, of thought that I think will engage students and faculty in different ways. It's inherently more interesting. So yeah. we do have this long multi-century history in the sciences of teaching in this, in this fairly, here's a bunch of information, learn this information, demonstrate that you've learned this basic information, but without applying it in a, in a real world setting. And the application I think we see over and over and over again in research um, is the thing that is most engaging and brings people most into. And as scientists, we tend to get most excited about. I did want to add, though, Stephen, yeah. something you mentioned about the pandemic. I think it's important to discuss your experiences helping faculty learn how to teach online in the face of the pandemic, because I think that experience really has informed how we think about the building as a, a real place, but in a reality that sometimes a, a physical place isn't a possible place, right? So what does it look like to do, to, to meld this online instruction and this physical place instruction, recognizing that both have benefits and drawbacks? So just to touch a little bit on my, my background is when I came to MSU is a little bit on uh, digital learning and how do you uh, think about online courses and online curriculum and especially in the pandemic, obviously we had to make a rapid shift to getting all faculty to being proficient um, or effective in that environment. But uh, there are some real benefits to just thinking about it in general around equity and accessibility. How did you help ramp up faculty, <laughs> Stephen? 
Yes. Well, we had these large training sessions, uh, not just me, obviously. It was a huge team effort across campus, but we ran probably 2,000 faculty through uh, those trainings. But I think what that showed was this idea of like, how can we use the affordances of technology in order to um, expand and give students a different experience that you know, it might uh, allow people with families or who have jobs more flexibility in order to um, still obtain their degree. And I think the STEM building uh, specifically, you know, like when we're talking about that experiential piece, that's what the building is really designed for, of how do you actually get students engaged in the activities uh, that uh, can, can let them see and feel and do these things um, and also have those technological affordances. So we have one room that we we call the pod room. It's a real <laughs> classroom. Some people might know it as. Yeah. So it's uh, set up for active learning. With large um, computer screens, students can, either a faculty member can project information to the screens at every table, or the students, if they're coding, can plug straight in and code together as a collaborative there are also other classrooms. Um, we call them the studio classrooms. So we have a physics classroom in there, for instance, where the students are working in small groups, but it can hold 120, is that correct, yeah. people? Um, there's also what we call the flat classroom that can house 180 students mm -hmm. in, again, this um, really incredible space that has hundreds of linear feet of whiteboards and then um, supply chain issues but when we get the the tables these are tables that have whiteboards on them and they pop up and you can roll them around the room so all of the furniture is functional in this really incredible way we didn't design this someone else did yes um there's also integral into the building itself because it's this old coal plant and they left some of the features of the plant one of my dreams is to have shout out to engineering faculty or construction management faculty, energy faculty, um, is to have a faculty member use the building itself as their classroom. Start from the ground and work their way up and really understand, because it's all there and visible. Um, so that's a dream yeah. of mine. I think some material scientists are already like using it with regards to the mass timber innovations for the construction of the building. But... Um, like those those innovative pieces that Julie mentioned, like so even talking about the video um, screens at each table that, that students can project to, we saw students actually, those who were not able to make it due to being sick, uh, who weren't able to make it to the class, could actually be zoomed in, and then they were projected on the TV, and their presence in the room mm -hmm. was actually fairly similar to if they had been there physically. Mm -hmm. And so it really transformed this ability to have flexibility about whether you are geographically able to attend or not. You could still engage in the content. And a shout out to RCPD, the Resource mm -hmm. Center for Persons with Disabilities. Um, this this um, flexibility really allows students with disabilities who, for whatever reason, are unable to physically be in the classroom to not fall behind and to really have the space adapt to needs. One of my dreams also is that we will no longer need to accommodate a disability, but instead the space will be adaptable. Yeah, Mike Hudson is a legend and an institution. Yes, he's my campus. neighbor. <laughs> and, a, and a neighbor. And so was the building designed with the STEM curriculum in mind, and, and how does the building enhance STEM teaching and learning? You've already been discussing yeah. that. So some STEM curriculum. Right? There are certain courses that, ha that um, run – a huge number of students um, every year. So the bio -sci curriculum, which Stephen, you might want to speak a little more about, um, the entry-level chemistry courses, um, some of the physics uh, courses that are um, studio physics, so these interactive physics courses. There's material science, um, computational math. So some of the STEM curriculum, but you, you can sort of see as I'm talking about it, there's not the entire STEM curriculum. And that's a question we get a lot. Faculty and departments and deans saying, how do I get my faculty into the building? And we are working on and are there, I think, with a process to um, allow the units that are in the building and helped, helped design the building in some ways um, be in those spaces, but then also make sure the spaces are being used 
all the time as much as possible, both the informal spaces and the formal classroom spaces. It is cool. There are some uh, performance spaces that are built into the building. So, like, we do see slam poetry being there some at some point in the near future. So, Oh, yes. I <laughs> yeah. love me a good slam. Yes. Well, so as STEM and STEAM sort of evolve on campus, just some challenges and opportunities that you see ahead. Well, definitely one of the challenges um, just across MSU, and it's almost with everything that you say, is the idea of siloing mm -hmm. because it's so large and there are so many, it, we're very, um, uh, disaggregated. We're very decentralized. decentralized. That's where I was going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, normally like you will mention an initiative and someone will be like, Oh yeah, I think, uh, this person over here is doing that. And this person over here is doing that. And so I, I feel like that's always a challenge and, but also in this case, I think an opportunity because we're already having discussions with people in arts and across mm -hmm. from various STEM uh, fields who already have relationships and who are already doing cool things. Um, but most people just don't know about it because it's it's isolated. Mm -hmm. And so, like, how can we actually bring those examples together and learn from them uh, is is one of the, I think, opportunities. So. Similar um, to what Stephen articulated, I um, have been engaging in listening sessions where I get 15 minutes to half an hour. I have a long list of like 250 faculty staff on campus I want to talk to who do some version of STEM writ large education research. Um, and I just want to understand what they do. I want to map out what it looks like on our campus. And in that conversation, I have a set of questions, um, brief questions. I want to just hear what's going on. And there's two things I've heard that I find as challenges. One is because of the siloing and the decentralization. Um, multiple faculty have articulated, researchers who are top researchers, have articulated that they just don't have, they have their own little community, but they don't feel a larger community at MSU for the STEM ed work, for everyone on campus. Um, that they don't know who's doing what work. And so um, they, multiple people have said they write their grant proposals, they get their funding, and they do their research in their own space. And it really never reaches out. And how do we, given MSU's tradition of, of which is nice, we get to sort of self-direct, um, how do we bring people together? And it, also with that academic um, model of competition and you've got to win and you have to get stuff for you. How do we transcend that? Um, the other thing is that, and this feeds into curriculum, um, I had a conversation with someone, and this is just one example, who created um, a curriculum for biology that had medical um, content in it. And when I was talking to them, they were in a college, and I said, oh, did you coordinate with the Office of Medical Education Research and Development? And they said, what? They'd never heard of it. And then I was talking to someone in the Office of Medical Education Research and Development, and I mentioned this curriculum, and they were like, what? They'd never heard of it. That is a challenge. How do we build relationships? How do we build trust to engage a community for the benefit of the individuals and the community? So if I could just... Um tie one example and of actually thinking about how our relationships with the arts is impacting how we're thinking about these problems is that we're collaborating with uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick and uh, Scott Shuprai in the College of Arts and Letters in their initiative on the MSU Commons. And so the MSU Commons is a digital platform that allows people to have um, – websites and create groups, but to also create artifacts that can then be referenced and cataloged and archived. And so um, that platform that they've created for the humanities called Humanities Commons. Yes. Um, will actually serve as the uh, as a basis for trying one for STEM. So having a STEM commons. And so uh, that type of <clears throat> communication and and discussion actually has led us to a potential solution for how do we connect these communities more broadly. Well, Julie and Stephen, I can see why they gave you both this position. <laughs> you see, complement each other 
each other very well, and uh, <laughs> I've enjoyed this conversation. Just as we close, some final thoughts, or is there anything important I didn't ask you that you'd like to leave our listeners with or some key takeaways from our chat? Honestly, I think the best part of this job has been having the space and the opportunity to connect with people and just hear what people are doing from undergraduates through upper administrators, learning how the institution functions at many levels. And so I would just say reach out um, if you want to share, if you have ideas, if you have needs. Um, we we want to collectively problem solve. Um, I will also say that one of the things that we did, which I was super excited about, is about 45 people at MSU came together to help put in a grant proposal for a, st- a postdoc cohort. Um, and not all of them are, are part of the proposal in a traditional way, but it was a community effort to do something for the community. And so if people are working on grant proposals or instructional design and they want to do it in a community-based way, um, reach out. And is there one website or would they just go to undergrad.msu.edu or where, where would what's the best place for people to find you? We are working on a, actually on the commons, having a location for all STEM education discussions. So we are calling it STEM Ed at State. And so it has um, a tab for education research. It has a tab for uh, STEM education. It has a tab for thinking about uh, what we're called the STEAM powered projects. And so, and the STEM building, and the STEM building itself. Like, how do you reserve space? And so, so it's STEM Ed at State. And if you Google, the easiest way is STEM Ed at State Commons, and you'll find the site. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you both for a great conversation today. You're thank welcome. you. And <laughs> thank you. I've been talking with Dr. Stephen Thomas. He's the Assistant Dean for STEM Education, Teaching, and Learning. And Dr. Julie Labarkin is the Associate Dean for STEM Education, Research, and Innovation both in the office of the Associate Provost for Undergraduate Education at Michigan State University. And I'm Russ White. This is MSU Today.